Today, we return to the Belt and Road Initiative, a topic that has been a regular feature of our lecture series for the last two years and will doubtless remain prominent in the years to come. The purpose and impact of the Belt and Road Initiative are much debated, but the reality of Chinese economic and political engagement far beyond its immediate neighborhood are indisputable. We have held events in the recent past that have looked at the BRI in Central, South and Southeast Asia. Today, we turn to the Middle East, where China has been the biggest foreign investor since 2016. It is estimated that China has injected at least $123 billion into the Middle East in BRI-related projects, including port and infrastructure projects in Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Oman, Djibouti and Egypt, 5G agreements with all of the Gulf Cooperation Council countries, and potentially a vast 25-year, 400 billion trade and security pact with Iran. So it seems appropriate, as well as very welcome, that our speaker today is Professor Anush Etashami, Professor of International Relations and Joint Director of the Center for the Advanced Study of the Arab World at Durham University. He is talking today on the topic, what is in it for us, China's BRI and the Middle East. Anush. Thank you very much, Michael, for your kind words and for this great uh, invitation. I think the Royal Society of Asian Affairs is home to best discussions that affects Asia and, and, and the wider world. And, and here today, we're trying to bring the two edges of Asia together. And, and there is no better home for the kind of debates that, that encompasses than the Royal Society of Asian Affairs. So I'm delighted uh, to have been invited and then to speak to you today on this, on this subject. Also, uh, I'm very conscious of the, the expertise that the society brings forth, um, not only through the dialogue that you've had uh, in, recent, in recent time about the BRI, but also about the depth of experience and knowledge that, that keeps the society at the forefront of discussions about Asia uh, and the wider world. So uh, I start with a, with a, with a slight, slight degree of hesitation given what's in store for me in the question and answer session, Michael, but I'm hoping that you'll be there to hold my hand and, and take me through it. So what's in it for us, um, China's BR in the Middle East, I, I, what I'd like to do is take, take us from the, the global macro level and then work our way into this, the, the deeper discussion, if I may, and I apologize in advance if some of the issues that I'm raising or I'm talking about are familiar with colleagues who are attending, but, but uh, at least for myself to have much more of a, a holistic understanding, uh, I'll feel better in, in doing so. Let me start then by talking about well, what is a changing world economy that we hear about so much. In the context of our discussion today, it has about half a dozen or so critical features. The first is that the shape of the global economy is changing and that the weight of the global economy is shifting and the changes in the economy, in, in the, in the economy uh, uh, causing a, a shift in the balance of power that are creating displacements in the fabric of the world economy. And I'm choosing my words carefully here. The weight, the shape and displacement. These are important when we look at the world economy in a, in a geostrategic sense. Secondly, what was a relatively slow process at the beginning of the post-Cold War period, 1990s, has accelerated into a much faster process of change since then. And the PRC in particular, China that is, uh, has been recording double digit annual growth rates over this sustained period in very recent times. But that has been happening while the Western economies and OECD countries, apart from South Korea, have appeared to be uh, registering rather anemic growth rates. So the relative change is also important uh, in this context. Thirdly then, the change in the rate of growth in the world's largest economies has created a major displacement in traditional trade and investment patterns. 
This is a new world in which we are living. And China, which is only one of a number of Asian countries who have been pulling the weight of the world economy eastwards is a critical actor. China is the only one which is arguably reshaping the system. The other countries, India, Japan, South Korea, and the smaller ASEAN countries that we often refer to are not in my view, world shaping. They are participants in the existing order. China is arguably the new economic sun around which much of Asia's economies are now orbiting. The 10 ASEAN countries, Japan, South Korea, and Australia are all uh, primary trading partners of China. This is important. So the argument I'm making therefore is that China is taking center stage. As the workshop of the world, which we've now come to regard China, manufacturing most of the world's consumed goods, China also became the net importer and itself consumer of huge quantities of the world's raw materials. You do not make a workshop without the ingredients that has to go into it. But I would argue of the many hundreds of different types of semi-processed and raw materials which have gone into China's economic miracle, none has mattered more to the Chinese economy than hydrocarbons, in particular oil. Hydrocarbons, particularly after 1993, by when China had become a net importer of oil for the first time, have come to play the primary role in driving China's massive industrialization, but also provided this link between China and its very ancient partners in the Middle East, in the Silk Road uh, kind of realm. So we now have a handful of countries, Iran, Iraq, and the six GCC countries, but not all of the six GCC countries, providing some 60% of China's imported oil needs. This is a huge dependency that China has now developed uh, towards these countries. While China's oil imports in 1993 stood at just 2.9 million uh, barrels of oil a day, by 2016, they had grown to 11.9 million barrels of oil a day. This is a phenomenal transformation of the world energy markets uh, for want of a better term. So oil imports as a consequence, and at the time when oil prices, we recall, were over $100 a barrel for a long period, uh, became one of the largest items on China's global trade transactions list. At some point, taking as much as 25% of value of China's imports. That is, again, a huge hit on what was an emerging global economy. But also, China said taking center stage was partly facilitated by the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 and the subsequent slow opening up of the, the rich inner Asia, what we know as Central Asia. And this became another factor in my argument in China's growing interest in territories and countries west of China. So by the early 2000s, when the rest of the world was learning to look east. Even India had developed a look east strategy. It's very clear to me that China was fixing its gaze westwards. China was beginning to discover the opportunities as well as the pitfalls of Soviet Union gone and growing dependency on oil imports from, from the Middle East, which China saw as a region dominated by the United States. In more recent times, however, there are five factors which have helped shape what has now become a strategy uh, towards Eurasia and towards expansion westwards. Let me list these, uh, if I may, Michael. The first is the 2008-2009 financial crisis, which crippled the US and European financial and banking systems and limited their, their abilities to invest beyond their, their, their known markets and also limited their investment vehicles and institutions. 
which accelerated at the same time, these prominent countries' national indebtedness. We know in Britain how that hurt Britain after the 2009 crisis, and we know what quantitative easing did to the US economy. That for China was an opportunity. Secondly, China's growing recognition of the need to spread the prosperity of its economic success from its coastal regions to the country's interior had become significant. And this was underlined in the 2000s in particular um, by uh, terrorist acts in, 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 in Western regions of China and Xinjiang. But that in, in, in one ways, in, in some ways actually demonstrated the importance and the need to spread development and, and prosperity to China's Western region, regions, which as we know, were also non-Han majority populations. There was a serious concern uh, in Beijing about these regions and therefore China being exposed to militancy, being important from neighboring Muslim countries and societies. The third factor, uh, has been pressures of over, over capacity within China itself, which has required remedies and the creation and generation of new, but also easily accessible markets for China's goods. And as we see now also services, whether it is cement, whether it's steel, whether it's tools, whether it's semi-processed goods, whether it is uh, 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 vehicles, whether it is infrastructure manufacturing and so on, all of these that China had began to manufacture in, in, in substantial quantities needed outlets. And as pressure on China grew from established Western markets for dumping and so on, China was desperate to find new areas for continuation of its prosperity through this, this export-led model of using its, its, its growing infrastructural capacity. Fourthly, there was also an increasing awareness of the new trade and investment opportunities arising in emerging parts of Asia. It took China a while to begin to appreciate the investment opportunities that were coming in Central Asia, some of whom, as you know, Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan are oil rich countries in their own right, but also have huge raw materials that China could tap into. Of course, as much as, much as West Asia, and the market riches of the Persian Gulf countries. And fifthly, and, la and last but not least, uh, the communist, uh, the Chinese Communist Party strategy uh, of recognizing in a sense that there was an ideal opportunity now for China to step beyond its, its traditional role. What the Communist Party has called the opportunity for, quote, one in a century transformation chance for China to take center stage. This notion is now shaping and driving China's broader strategy was important. So these five factors have helped put China and China's own image of itself and where it needs to be center stage. It's in this context that now we can look at the Belt and Road Initiative, which is arguably at the very heart of the strategy which is now being framed by the five factors uh, I, I mentioned above. First, the BRI has evolved from much earlier and largely domestic focus agendas for development of the interior. This is not some strategy for domination of the world, in my view. Secondly, in the 2000s, it quickly changed from what was a modest new Silk Road policy to the One Belt, One Road initiative, equally ill-defined in, in the 2010s to what is now a, a, a main strategic plank of China's outward drive, the Belt and Road Initiative. But it's interesting that China doesn't call it a project, doesn't call it a program, doesn't call it a strategy. It continues to refer to it as an initiative, which diffuses concerns about the centrality of this as a strategic uh, uh, project of domination for China. Third, as BRI, as we know it today, was, was, was launched in 2013, formally by President Xi Jinping, uh, and, and it was vast in scale, unlike its predecessors, 
which didn't talk about numbers. The BRI has a multi-trillion dollar price tag attached to it. And it covers much of Eurasia. It has six pathways, land and maritime, uh, includes infrastructure projects. Uh, it runs a maritime network right into uh, Western Indian Ocean. Um, it, 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 it comes, it flows out of Western China, going northwards through Russia, Kazakhstan and Russia, Belarus into Europe. It cuts across Central Asia, going to Turkmenistan into Iran. It, it comes down the, down the Chinese Pakistan economic zone to Gwadar and then into Indian Ocean. Uh, and of course, we know about the so-called uh, string of pearls, which is also tied, uh, albeit loosely, to the BRI. So this is a vast enterprise, which is deemed to connect crisscrossing continental Asia, but also deemed to connect Eurasia as a single uh, economic landmass, but also navigating Indian Ocean right across over to East Africa. The BRI is also a serious undertaking in terms of Chinese policy itself. It now has a dedicated bureaucracy. It has been written in the China, Chinese uh, state's constitution as an important plank of, of China's uh, relations with the world. And it's supported by its own financial institutions, whether it is the, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, whether it is the Silk Road Fund, whether it is joint financing of projects with, with key partners, it has massive domestic infrastructure underpinning it in China itself, which is no surprise that China has been able to roll it out now in terms of partners of over 80 countries. I think the list is nearly 100, uh, but some of these projects are greater than others. Some argue that the BRI's an articulation of the Communist Party's strategy to transform China into a global power, not just an, an Asian power. That it will want to make China Asia's in, indispensable power at the time of transition. That it is a way of ensuring China's economic prosperity by embedding Eurasia's vast natural resources into China's expanding orbit that as China grows, it needs these peripheral regions to sustain that growth, that it is seen to firmly shift the global balance of power towards Eurasia. And if China sits at the heart of Eurasia, it goes by the same reasoning that therefore China will dominate uh, Eurasia. And also it is said to be part of a strategy of create, creating strong interdependencies uh, between China and Eurasia and Africa, which are all being driven through China and therefore creates these networks, these, these ties that ensures China will continue to play an active part in any economic changes taking place in this vast region. The BRI therefore, if we unpack it, has a political and economic, a geostrategic and a strategic agenda. It is in many ways an, an, an overarching global strategy, but it is an open-ended uh, open agenda and program of development. It has a start date, but it doesn't have an end date. And the parties have been very clear in the way that they approach this. Countries can drop in, countries can drop out. There is no compulsion in the way that China is uh, uh, unrolling BRI uh, in Eurasia. But nevertheless, the BRI will reshape the global economy in China's image. It will bring into China's proximity over 60% of the world's GDP, 70% of the world's population, and 75% of the world's known energy resources. These underpin the making of the superpower, uh, in, my, in my view. Enough said about China, enough said about China's place in the world. Let me now focus, if I may, uh, Michael, on BRI and the Middle East a bit more closely. 
the BRR's role, activities, growth are being developed through institutions and are being implemented through and along several sometimes competing planks and platforms. So again, there is no single strategy uh, in play here. And these are being done through both bilateral and multilateral negotiations. Secondly, BRI projects seem aligned with, with China's strategic interests in the Middle East. Now, whether this is accident or design is something which is fortuitous as far as China is concerned, because it ties in China's uh, energy partners into a structured relationship. It gives China access to this geopolitically important part of the world. BRI underpins that, that importance. And of course, also it gives China access to what are still very important markets, particularly in West Asia itself. In most instances, uh, China's West Asian partners are able to finance BRR link projects themselves, which is a real bonus for China. All China has to do is to deliver the expertise and the material for these projects, which often have to come from China itself. China doesn't like using local suppliers. It will bring its own materials for reasons that I've explained earlier. But in a place like Qatar, in a place like the UAE, in a place like, like Saudi Arabia, uh, it, it doesn't have to provide the finance or the cash uh, for these either, which is a blessing as far as China is concerned because it can reserve the cash for other places. What are the other places? Iran, Iraq, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, sorry, and in Israel, where China's financial support, be it direct investment or through loans or even barter in the case of Iran, become important in seeing through the, the introduction and implementation of, of BRI linked projects. So China today is the main trading partner of 10 important Middle East countries and is the primary, that is to say one, two, three, uh, partner of a further five uh, important uh, Middle East countries. What that means is that in fact, China has over 200, consume, 200 million consumers uh, in, in the Middle East uh, region uh, as, of, as of now. Also, China today has so-called strategic partnerships with nine Middle East countries and has three so-called comprehensive strategic partnerships. The three are Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. And again, I would argue there is very good reason for these being regarded as comprehensive strategic partnerships. So let me now look through which are China's key Middle East partners and where, are, where do these partnerships fall um, and, and, and how are these links being, being developed? Let me start with the Gulf Cooperation Council, the six countries of so-called oil monarchies. I think the tie-ups are within hydrocarbons, uh, primarily, uh, upstream and downstream energy partnerships, investments, whether developing, developing these in the region itself, but as in addition, also in China and in East Asia, China is very keen to co-invest in such projects with Qatar, with Saudi Arabia, and, and with the UAE. But that's not all though. I think there are uh, critical infrastructure projects. Uh, there is a need for access um, and of course, development of energy in the region. Uh, li liquidified natural gas plant, for example, in Qatar is now a, a Chinese priority. Kuwait's building of its silk city on an island to facilitate China's access towards Europe is another major pro project. Uh, the development of Dome of the coast of Oman as a strategic port, uh, that part of Indian Ocean's deepest docks are, are, are in Durham, is a, a priority um, for China. Um, in Saudi Arabia, under the radar, nuclear cooperation, above the radar, helping in, in development of, of housing, uh, rail, 
and other infrastructure projects. So just within the GCC, opportunities are enormous and both parties are converging on, on many of these as possible. And China is working independently with, with each of these countries. So there is a danger that Kuwait's Silk City may come to compete with Dubai. What happens in Dubai will compete with Saudi Arabia and so on. The second country of import, importance to China is Egypt. Uh, Egypt is a gateway country as far as China is concerned, and it's a pivot for access to three continents of Africa, of Europe, and of course, part of Asia as well. China is engaged in development of infrastructure and major construction projects uh, in Egypt. They're building a whole new capital city. Uh, China is central to that development, which includes housing. There is building of metro, railroads, the, the project of Suez II, uh, which we now appreciate is, is, is a must, given what happened uh, in the recent past when the Suez Canal was blocked. Uh, that will have concentrated China's mind on the importance of Egypt uh, as a transit route uh, for trade. And of course, Egypt itself is now potentially an energy hub given the discovery of, of offshore oil deposits uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean running right up to the coast of, of Lebanon. So Egypt is, is vital to this process. And that is why there is a strategic, comprehensive strategic partnership between Egypt and China. The third one, of course, is Israel, small country, but highly important in terms of its high-tech industries and, and innovative uh, venture capitalists who are investing in this project, but also as an infrastructure hub uh, for the BRI. For example, the rail load between Ilat and Ashkelon is important uh, way of avoiding a crisis on, in the Suez Canal. Uh, and the creation of a Red Sea East Med, which would give access to China's increase and large investments in Greece would then be facilitated for that kind of connection across Israel. But of course, also there are military uh, technological ties between China and Israel that, that China would like to, to exploit further. Fourthly, and these are not in any particular order, of course, is Iran. You've mentioned yourself, Michael, the importance of this new 25 year, $400 billion deal, which again is an amalgamation of a series of other discussions and, and negotiations between China and Iran, but it's been packaged in this form for obvious political reasons. Iran is vital, why? Because it is the only anti-US West Asian country, uh, which is proud of, 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 of its credentials. It has abundance of underdeveloped and, and undeveloped oil and natural gas resources, which is significant uh, for China. It has huge deposits of other natural resources uh, that have not been exploited fully because of lack of investment. It is a critical spatial link in the BRI. We note that two of the connections are either through or in close proximity to Iran. And China is conscious of Iran-India negotiations about Chapahar port, which looks sideways at China's Gwadar port, and which would give India access through Afghanistan and Iran to Central Asia, something which it, which it is now denied by virtue of geography. Um, and, and of course, that is important uh, for Iran to be able to hedge. Uh, and of course, Iran's own huge domestic market. Iran is in many ways Asia's last Eldorado. It has huge resources, enormous opportunities, which have remained untapped because of sanctions, because of Iran's own wrong policies, because of economic policy incompetence and so on. But Iran is now in the 21st century ready for picking and China is positioning itself as a prime uh, mover in, in that direction. Fifth, Iraq, in many ways, a neglected garden. Iran's oil, uh, Iraq's oil and gas infrastructures are in ruins. Iraq is hugely rich in natural gas 
and, and oil deposits. And China, before the war, was with the war of 2003, was the main investor in Iraq's uh, hydrocarbons facilities. It would like to go back to that as quickly as possible, and it needs stability uh, in Iraq. But also, Iraq, as part of this network, will give easier access through Iraq and then Syria to the Eastern Mediterranean and China's maritime presence in the Mediterranean. And last but not least, Turkey, which is a latecomer to the BRI party. Turkey was the only Muslim country which had stood firm um, against China's policies in Xinjiang. Um, and in fact, many of the activists, uh, the so-called Turkestan movement are, are residing in Turkey. Um, until, until recently, uh, Turkey had a very dim view of what China was doing in its, in its Western provinces. In recent times though, and partly as a response to its worsening relations with the European Union, but also with the United States, uh, Turkey is looking at, at, at BRI much more uh, positively and much more anxiously as well. Turkey is now offering itself as a route across out of Central Asia and the Caucasus to Europe. It can do so via Greece and also via Black Sea right into the heart of Europe, which are important. But also Turkey itself is a large market uh, with huge opportunities and in desperate need of energy. And again, it's no surprise that one of the key projects which are going on between Turkey and, and China is a, is, a, uh, is a thermal power reactor being built by Chinese expertise. So in terms of a quick, quick recap, Middle East BRI projects are evolving. They are ad hocly added and are often separate from each other. There isn't a sinister plan in the way that the BRI is unrolled and unfolding in this part of the world. They don't follow a pattern of design domination, it seems to me. And also when you look at pre-pandemic investment figures in the Middle East, and you noted earlier yourself, Michael, it was already over $100 billion. There are interested parties in facilitating China's access to these, to these markets. So to answer the question, what's in it for us? Let me give us a very quick list of what these might be. First, from the perspective of the Middle Eastern countries, easy access to the world's largest economy to be. The BRI means that they will have swift access to China and vice versa, China will hopefully in their eyes, prioritize them as part of its global strategy. Secondly, and the World Bank has made this very clear, that development needs good infrastructure. Without good infrastructure, it's like rain in the desert. BRI provides opportunity for development, but also opportunity for diversification. Because it will, as we see in Pakistan, for example, along the BRI developments, uh, secondary opportunities present themselves for the local entrepreneurs and even the state to use and, and capitalize on. Thirdly, when capital markets are tight or conditions for loans are, are restrictive, the BRI gives ready access to capital, loans, and expertise in the process of implementation. It's a one-stop shop that these countries never had before. Also, it comes without a political sting. China makes clear from the very beginning that its BRI, its growing economic presence, comes with no political preconditions. They continuously use the phrase win-win. And that sounds very sweetly to elites who always worry about the interference of external actors in their internal affairs. That China comes with no political interference price tag, it seems to them. And by the same time, at the same time also, this means that they can have a potential shield from Western promoted projects. 
democracy promotion being a classic example of this, that growing presence of China and their growing links with China will provide this support mechanism that will enable them to distance themselves from the pressures that the United States and Europe might put on them in terms of human rights, in terms of democracy promotion and so on. In other words, uh, sixthly, that BRI provides sovereignty security for these countries. Next, it also comes with a degree of political affinity. I can't emphasize enough the importance for the, for the Middle East elites of being partner with the first emerging global power from the global south. They take great pride in seeing a developing country look at the United States in the eye, to have a global ambition, but also see the rest of the world, developing world, as its genuine partners. Uh, they genuinely believe the, the, the narrative of China and are desperately willing to be part and parcel of the, the post-1800 order now being shaped by China. Uh, also, it is a policy of hedging. The more options you have, the better you feel in terms of your national strategy and your security. China is a safe hedge for many of these countries. But also, as I mentioned earlier, as China gets involved in infrastructural projects, in building up ports and housing and roads and rail and metros and telecommunications projects, uh, 5G, again, you mentioned yourself, Michael, these also will provide jobs and mobilize this region's largest asset, which is its youthful population, into more productive realms, or at least that is their argument. And also they're hopeful that as China learns about environmental management, it will bring that expertise into this region, which badly needs it as well. These are state to state negotiations. It is true that Chinese companies have a free hand in going ahead and, and, and starting negotiations, but somebody further up has to sign off these projects. And these countries are content, given the, the position of their elites in terms of control of their, of their economies, to have state-to-state -state negotiations, that China is very happy to talk to elite level uh, partners in this regard. And these countries are also happy to be driving this themselves because their assumption is that if it goes well, they will also get the reflected glory from having initiated and led through these projects. Um, what are the challenges though? There are many and, and, and I'm conscious of time, Michael, so I will be brief uh, here. First and foremost, we've seen in countries like Iran and Israel, for example, that there is domestic opposition to the, the, what they see as encroachment of China's power. Into their, into their borders. These are coming from businesses, from civil society, from trade unionists, but also from members of the elite who are very conscious in case of Iran of losing sovereignty hard won in the revolution. And in case of Israel of losing America's patronage uh, as, a, as a consequence. Um, China has no control over this domestic opposition. Uh, but in my view, nor does it have a strategy of addressing it or diffusing it. That's partly because much of its dialogue is at state to state level rather than people to people level. Even though China encourages, uh, in, encourages interaction uh, uh, at the below state level, encourages students going to study in China. It has created a vast BRI network of centers and so on research centers, nevertheless, there, this concern is, is a real one. Secondly, also, as we've seen in COVID, Chinese Minister of Foreign Affairs has said that about a quarter of its BRI projects have been adversely affected by COVID. That actually, there is no guarantee of proceeding or success of the projects. And also there is always a chance that China itself would get cold feet or will be distracted. We've seen this happen in so many other instances where China has gone head, head first into a project and then after a while has quietly shelved it to the detriment 
of the other parties involved, there is that concern that how do we keep China engaged? Uh, what do we do if it's distracted? And what do we do if it gets cold feet because of a crisis and other conflict and such like in the Middle East region? Also, they are worried, although China is trying to address this, about all the rhetoric about China's conditions for access to capital and loans. For the countries that are dependent on that, Oman is an example, Egypt is another example, there is a fear that China's terms and conditions might be too restrictive as not to enable these countries to access capital and loans and investment from other parties uh, internationally, that they'll be tied too closely uh, to China's mechanisms. Uh, then there is US opposition. What do we do when the US objects? In the case of Israel, of course, very strongly. While 5G has gone under the radar so far, what do they do if the United States regards 5G as a security threat to its interests in Saudi Arabia, in Qatar, in Bahrain, in UAE, in Oman, in Iraq, where it has a military presence uh, as well? Uh, there are no clear answers uh, to this. And indeed, what do they do when China and the and, and, and United States uh, lock horns over, over the Middle East, if were, were that uh, to happen? And then, of course, there is the bigger concerns about Middle East instability, which is of concern to the rest of us in the world, but is also an equal concern for the countries themselves. Going out on a limb to develop links with China and then find themselves bombarded by the Houthis uh, from next door Yemen is not a story that can easily sell uh, as a sustainable market for continuing Chinese investment. So they are worried about the impact of instability in the region itself. And this partly explains why, indeed, they, the 25-year agreement between China and Iran might facilitate the, the re, rekindling of the JCPOA because Iran knows that China needs that stability uh, for the implementation of these multi-billion dollar uh, projects. And then last but not least, of course, there is discontent in China itself. When the BRI was launched, there were voices in China about why are you taking our money to these unknown, unsafe places? What, why are you exposing China to uncertainty in Central Asia and in the Middle East when there are plenty of credible established markets to work with? And that is at the heart of the question of transparency and control. Who makes these deals? Who controls them? And where do the country, countries that are negotiating them are in this pile of, of relationships? So these are my, my thoughts on what's in it for us. Um, I hope that it's been of, of interest to the Royal Society's uh, community of of listeners and learned, learned experienced uh, members. And I look forward very much to Q and A and, and a discussion. Michael, thank you. Anish, thank you very much indeed. That, that was a fascinating tour of, uh, uh, of uh, the developments of the BRI in, uh, in the Middle Eastern context. I'm going to start with, um, a couple of questions from Huki Walker. The first one uh, should be relatively easy uh, to answer. Huki asks, uh, which of the yachts in the picture behind you is yours? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Huki, very much for that question. It's, it's my fleet. In, in which case, we will move on. Um, <laughs> he, he said, you, you mentioned a number of motivations for China's BRI policy. I mean, in the Middle Eastern context, which do you think is the most important to them? Which carries most weight? I, I, I don't think China is prioritizing in, in, in those terms. I think partly it's opportunistic. They'll grab what's available. Um, and if it's not available, they move on to the next one. But in terms of policy priorities, it's Durum in Oman, it is Iran, and this vast 25-year set of projects. It's UAE, particularly Dubai. It is Saudi Arabia and it's Egypt. 
these are the main countries for reasons that I've discussed that stand out as priorities for China. Uh, if we turn and say which ones it can't do with, I would say Egypt, Iran, UAE, and Oman. Thank you. Um, uh, and um, could I just uh, mention to the audience, please do uh, submit questions uh, that you would uh, you you would like Anush to address. You have a Q and A button at the bottom of your screen, and uh, we will do our best to get through them all. Um, Anish, Anthony Wynne um, asks about the presence of the Chinese fishing fleet in the Persian Gulf, um, which, uh, as he says, apart from hoovering up catastrophic quantities of fish, um, is there any other purpose to the presence of the fishing fleet? Uh, I, no, I think, I think the question has uh, got it spot on. It is, it is, again, you know, some of those stocks were under uh, developed and under exploited um, and, and, and China moved in big time uh, and that has created serious, serious negative publicity for China in Iran itself. But also, of course, you know, given the Persian Gulf is such a small waterway, you know, the fish and the prawns in particular go in all sorts of directions and Iran's prawns are prized amongst the GCC markets. And it's had a real knock-on effect in terms of access to these and, and prices, but also is deprived Iranian fishing fleet, small fishermen of ability to sell clandestinely fish and prawns and other sea products uh, in Dubai and in Kuwait and elsewhere. So it, it's, it's had a very negative impact um, and it's something the Iranian government would rather not talk about if they can help it. Interesting. Um, the, um, the the issue of a debt trap has uh, been raised in in a number of contexts in connection with the BRI. Um, how, um, if at all, does China deal with that in the Middle Eastern context? I mean, there, there's a sort of the issues of transparency, of um, disregard for the environment, uh, corruption, creation of dependencies. Uh, are these um, issues that are um, being that China is being challenged on in the Middle East, and and if so, how do they respond? Uh, again, they've been very conscious of the negative publicity over the port in Sri Lanka, which actually wasn't their fault, but that's a different story uh, altogether. Um, and also, of course, about the debt burden in sub-Saharan Africa and so on. But in the context of BRI, they set up two um, tribunal type organizations that, that deal with first any delivery problems that you told us you're gonna build us a five-star hotel and it's only a three-star hotel, what do we do about it? So in terms of standards and quality uh, and also uh, on, on, on the question, sorry, I'm being distracted by stuff appearing by bottom three, and also by um, uh, the, the financial regime for any of these projects. In the past, there was no opportunity for arbitration. China is now conscious of that and is now offering arbitration, albeit in China, for uh, any financial disputes that may arise. And it's within that context that they're talking about uh, terms for lending uh, money as well. Um, what is interesting is that the loans are now having to be packaged around China's interest in, in internationalizing the renminbi. So they would like these to go through that route. But where there is no money to be had in terms of the exchange, in case of Iran, for example, they take a bit discount on oil exported from, from, from these countries to China. Um, and you know the, the word is that, that we don't quite know the exact figure that it could be anything up to 30% discount on oil exports to China, which from the Chinese perspective is an extraordinary saving uh, of money. And also it, they can barter uh, with, with Iran and other countries as well. Um, 
but because many of the 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 highline projects in Saudi Arabia and Qatar and UAE are more or less self-financing and in Kuwait, they're not coming to the fourth as problems. And where China is heavily investing, in Oman in particular, they seem to be doing it on terms which are favorable to the Omanis. Whether that's because Durham is such a strategic port or, or that Durham is part of the string of Purs uh, in relation to Gwadar and Djibouti and so on as well, is, a, is an open question that we can explore further. Thank you. Uh, and Rob, Robin Lam has, has asked the, uh, the, the, the very large question. Uh, what, what is the risk of China establishing an accidental empire as its economic interests require security of communications and the fleet it develops and so on? That, that is such an interesting question. Do you know, in many ways, I think it is an accidental uh, rise in some ways because China grew in itself, for itself, but also eventually for the rest of the world um, to a point where it is awash with foreign currency um, and that foreign currency has got no profit. They need to mobilize this. They need to create value added and BRI is the perfect vehicle for some of those, as well as addressing overcapacity, as I mentioned earlier. And, and slowly but surely, the world is changing in the very front of, of, of Chinese leaders' eyes. And here they are with the agenda, as well as the resources and the ambition to become a credible global power. This is Xi Jinping's China dream in many ways. And as such, it is true that they've become an accidental empire and that they will have to manage. In fact, if you follow uh, literature in China about international relations, the notion of tributaries is already mentioned in the literature about China and Asia. Um, some would associate the string, string of pearls in Indian Ocean as a security agenda. Uh, some see the, the China-Pakistan economic corridor as a security corridor that, that gives access to Gwadar for, for China, which hasn't happened. Some see the port in Sri Lanka as a naval staging port, which it is not. In fact, many other countries have, have visited that port, but not Chinese military, not the Chinese Navy there. And that, as you say, it could actually be part of this accidental process. Uh, and in some ways, I don't think China is ready for it. China has never shown an appetite for extending its security influence beyond the East and South, South China Sea so far. Uh, now, whether that will change or not, I think will depend much about the behavior of other major powers than China itself. Thank you. Um, I, a couple of questions that are um, sort of linked, uh, I think, and um, uh, are turn on the, the question of Iran's relationship with other parts of the world. Um, um, Ali Burhani asks, uh, are there potential showstoppers that can affect the 25-year the deal? Um, could China get cold feet? Or is this going ahead regardless of the resuscitation of the JCPOA? And on a, a closely related angle from Gordon Ruquette, um, he says, Iran has a tendency to look west, not east. Um, uh, if the Americans recover their influence within the next year, um, how, um, how might that play in this context? Yeah, two excellent questions from Ali and, and, and Gordon. Um, it, I think both, both China and the United States have got their eyes on Iran for very different, different reasons. Uh, I, I think this, this deal is not a contract. It's a pact of investment initiatives in infrastructure and in energy. The vast amount, the vast part of it is of course investment in energy. 
But also China is very conscious that it needs to bring the BRI closer to Iran. It, at one point it was avoiding Iran, but now that this is on paper, uh, that it needs to, to bring BRI closer to Iran. And that requires Chinese investment in, in Iranian infrastructure, uh, certainly in the Northeast part of the country, uh, close you know, to, to the border with Turkmenistan and so on. So I think that will go on irrespective of this, the package itself. I think once sanctions are lifted, Iran will be desperate for Chinese investment in its hydrocarbons uh, resources. All of these countries recognize that the window for their oil exports is less than 50 years now. It's probably 30 years from now and that they would, they would need to maximize the return on these deposits before they become defunct as a major source of energy. There are other ways in which you can use gas and, and, and oil, but the driver is for, for, for generation of energy. And, and Iran is very conscious, as indeed is Iraq, that they are way behind the competition to create the capacity for production and export. Iran is the world's second largest uh, deposit for natural gas, for example. It has no vehicle at present to explore, exploit, and export the natural gas. China is begging for this. Once JCPOA is signed, no one can object to Chinese investments in development of Iran's gas fields, in modernization of its, 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 its refinery in Abadan, and, 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 and platforms for extracting uh, oil and so on. So I think it will carry on. Okay, the Americans may object to calling it a 25 year agreement between Iran and China, um, but I don't think Americans would object to seeing Iran finally develop uh, and money going into it to stabilize it and bring it more into the mainstream of the global economy. Certainly this administration recognizes it. The previous one didn't, but this one knows that, that engagement pays off. And if it can't do it itself, it would rather have its partners do it. And if they can't do it, then it wouldn't mind China doing it, given that it still assumes that China is committed to the current international networks, uh, as it were. Uh, so I don't think JCPOA will have an adverse effect on this. And I don't think China will question many of these projects. The one area where the Americans would be focusing on would be the military aspect of this. Uh, and it is in there. Uh, again, conversation is that there will be 5,000 Chinese troops stationed in Iran to monitor its, its various investments. China has done this before elsewhere because it's very conscious of attack on its personnel. It nearly lost so many of them in Libya during the, the revolution there, for example. Um, uh, it, I mean, it's a, it's a big pill for Iran to swallow to have foreign troops on its soil. Uh, so they have to cross that bridge when they get to it. But for the Americans, this will be the tip of a much, much bigger iceberg that brings Chinese military hardware, which it has been doing to Iran as well. So that would be one that they'll be probably worried about. But I can't see that being part of the JCPOA discussions or something that will block Iran's ability to reignite relations with Europe in particular, just because it is part of this deal. Gordon's question, Michael, uh, I think I've answered as well. Uh, I, I, indeed, I, I, I think you have, and uh, you, you've taken us to uh, something that uh, Barney Smith had mentioned. I think you've, you've already covered it in a sense, but he had noted that um, uh, all the discussion is about oil and gas. Uh, when the future everyone I think now accepts is renewables. Um, what does that mean for the, the sort of time scale of China's interest, if you like? I mean, it, it is the expectation that this is something that will outlast uh, the, uh, the hydrocarbons uh, or, or is that just so far in the future that at the moment no one is thinking about it? Oh no, I, I think there are, there are thinking about it very seriously. Um, for China itself, of course, the, all the pressure is on China now to reduce its, its coal power generating 
infrastructure, because that's what is what is creating all this uh, all this pollution and and the adverse effect on the on the environment and so on. Of course, one way of doing that is to substitute it with natural gas. And and so, were they to be pressed in the in the upcoming discussions about the environment uh, with their Western partners, I can see the opportunity for them to argue about a winding up of their coal power generating plants over a certain period in exchange for China being assisted in exploiting the natural gas resources of Iran, of Kazakhstan, of Russia and Qatar as compensation, for example. Right? It, these things have happened before, but also these same countries are very conscious of the need to develop renewable energy. Nuclear power is one. Iran has a power, power nuclear power station, UAE in Saudi Arabia um, on the way and so on. China wants to be part of this game. It's been frozen out by Russia, but it wants to get in there um, for, for sure, but also they are now very interested in exploiting China's market advantage in solar panel uh, technologies with the Chinese inherited from Germany as it happened through all sorts of nefarious ways. But, you know, Pakistan, for example, is now seen as a, a space for massive solar power generation. Chinese are investing and installing massive solar power uh, plants and, 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 and parks in Pakistan, uh, which is of immensely important news for Pakistan itself, but also it, you, it has the potential for export. Saudi Arabia is going down the same route. UAE is going down the same route. And ultimately Iran will have to as well. So first hydrocarbons are unlikely to be taken out of the mix altogether in the next few decades. Secondly, gas will continue to be a very important source of energy for China and the rest of us. And thirdly, both sides are now looking at installation of renewable energy sources. But as I've tried to argue, while energy underpinned the growth in these bilateral relations between West Asia and China, it's one of many strands of cooperation that we now see. And what China would like to do is to be able to grow this economy sufficiently so that it's not all about oil, that it's about other areas of expertise and prowess that China has. China itself is now a labor expensive economy and it is beginning to shift the industries that came to China in the 80s and 90s over to other countries nearby. Um, um, and, and, and you know places like Thailand, like Vietnam uh, and, and so on, uh, Philippines come to mind. So labor cost is now a calculation in China's broader economic strategy. And if it can continue to export its commodities, manufactured goods to these markets, which are cash rich, when it can't compete in Western markets over price and quality, but price in particular, then it will take these markets as best it can. Thank you very much. Um, it, I'm just going to move to a, uh, an adjacent geographical area. Um, Henry Gibbons um, says, you did not mention Djibouti and the Horn of Africa, which are closely related to the Middle East. Um, uh, how do you think uh, China's activities, as you've described them, will relate to that area? Uh, uh, I did mention Djibouti as part of my, my String of Pearls uh, presentation. So, so I'll take only half of the, 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 the comment. Um, uh, I, Djibouti started as an anti-piracy uh, station, uh, but now has grown uh, to a much, much bigger pseudo naval base that gives China a view of Bab al Mendeb end of the Red Sea, which is really, really important. And of course, 
easier access to the Suez Canal and Egypt too. Uh, so it is China's behavior in, in that part of the world is very similar to the behavior of all previous great powers. It's all about geopolitics, access and navigation. And China is the latest in that, but not unique in, in the way that is approaching it. Thank you. Um, and um, perhaps finally, um, a, a question that goes back to uh, potential Chinese uh, involvement in regional security. Um, uh, we've already talked about um, the risk of accidental empire, um, something that Britain seems to have succeeded in doing in the 19th century. Um, does China show any interest in ensuring peace and security in and between its priority markets, such that it might look to take a role in developing regional security frameworks, for example? Yeah, well, what, what a very interesting question to end on, Michael. Uh, the, the simple answer is yes, it is. It is, you know, it has actually just recently uh, unrolled a 10 point plan for Middle East security that includes uh, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, that includes dialogue uh, amongst religions and, and ethnicities, you know, a, a shorthand for Iran and Saudi Arabia tensions, um, and offering itself as, as, as a good citizen in, in trying to help parties negotiate fairly and objectively with each other for the greater good. Um, and, 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 and absolutely, China is, is very focused on this because you know, conflict and insecurity are bad for business. And if you go back to the old ideas of mercantilism, you know, mercantilist approaches do not thrive on, on, on instability. You want to be in a strong position of exploiting opportunities rather than putting out fires. And so far, the US has been doing that. And China is now conscious that that time may well be ending. Afghanistan is a good example of this. China is very keen, for example, to, to ensure Afghanistan's stability. They've already invested two and a half billion dollars in Afghanistan and are very uh, committed to stabilize it for their own reasons, uh, by and large. Uh, and, and, and you can see from their perspective that when the NATO forces move out in September, it'll have to become a problem for the regional countries, many of whom, Pakistan and Iran in particular, with which China now has very close intimate links. Afghanistan will be an open wound and it, it's focused on that. Where the US to relinquish its broader naval political military presence in West Asia, I think that would be of concern to China, but they're not in a position uh, to, to replace United States. In fact, they have little ambition in becoming the global superpower. They much rather have somebody else do that for them, but they will support initiatives to stabilize uh, open dialogue and find multilateral solutions to the problems that the region faces. Thank you very much indeed. I'm afraid that we will have to wind up there. And I apologize for uh, uh, the many questions that we haven't been able to address. Um, but I would like to thank you, Anoush, on behalf of the society and our audience for a fascinating talk today. And um, I'd like to remind everybody that a recording will be available in the next few days on the RSAA YouTube channel. I'm very pleased also to let you know that we are collaborating with Professor Eta Shami on a project on China-Iran relations that will appear in our journal Asian Affairs in 2022. Our next webinar will be on Thursday the 6th of May when the film director Sean Whitaker will be discussing the first two of his short films about Ladakh with James Croton and a notice about that will be sent out shortly. I hope that we will see you then, but for now, goodbye. Thank you very much for having me, Michael.
It's been a real pleasure. Thank you.